Hey and welcome to the India Hangout, donkeys, monkeys, DNA tests. Uh, this is of course uh, the language of political discourse today. Has this gone really from the sublime to the ridiculous? And that's of course a most mild way of putting it. Uh, let's begin with uh, Ayaz Bemen. What do you think? <laughs> you know, I think what's happening is that uh, obviously we are seeing a new level of discourse now, whether it's... Yeah. You know, the word discourse itself is of course... <laughs> yeah, whether it's Nietzsche Rajinity or not and yeah. how you want to interpret it is your problem. But what we have seen is, it's a gloves off, no holds barred fight which is happening, which is telling us something not just about our political class, hmm. but in some, some way I think right. about ourselves because we are lapping it up. Okay. Great. So, Dilip Chariot, uh, public relations, uh, uh, a man is here. So is Ranjana Banerjee, columnist uh, on media. Uh, Dilip, if any of these people were your clients, what would you be telling them? I'd be telling them that they should figure out whether their audiences are enjoying this kind of thing. And I suspect the worrying thing, in, and in fact, it's linked to what Ayaz just said, that a large number of people who are their audience may actually be lapping this kind of stuff up and that worries me. It worries me because clearly I'm disoriented or disconnected from this bunch of people who probably want to hear um, a level of discourse which is um, substantially lower than one that we, and I, I, I use this word purposely, have been grown to expect. So. And, and what does that uh, suggest, Dilip, that has the election platform, I mean, you know, the physical election platform, maybe on a hot and dusty day uh, somewhere uh, in the hinterland or for that matter in the heart of a city, uh, has that become something uh, less of a serious vehicle to do something or to say something serious or to promise something serious? You know, all the stuff we would expect politicians to do and then perhaps be accountable for. You know, I think it varies from place to place, but I think that the dusty back streets of urban India and rural India, you have seen the quality of language, you've seen the quality of the level of abuse, the level of indiscreet use of certain epithets uh, increase a lot in the last few years. And this you sense even if you just walk on the streets. Now, it is expected that leaders should not fall to the lowest common patwa and adapt what is street language and which just is one level above gutter language uh, as their language of discourse. But in an attempt to connect in inverted commas with this audience, they are probably stooping in the hope of conquering. Right. So, uh, Dilip, the question and concern obviously for all of us is, now one is that, yes, this is the middle of May and, uh, you know, temperatures being what they are and the fact that it's a long election, last lap uh, and people are letting go and letting loose. So therefore, it may all uh, generally, uh, uh, gently subside and obviously end in, in a couple of weeks time. Is there a residue you think? Uh, I worry that there is a residue. I think that once quality of discourse descends to a certain level, it ascends back only, it draws back only marginally. It doesn't go back to where it came from. Okay. Yes. I, I would be in agreement with that. I think Dilip has probably hit the nail on the head as far as I am concerned. Look, I think what's happened is that this is the first election that we are seeing where the full might of the Indian media as it has grown, mm. you know, in geometrical progression since the last elections is being used. So, there's a lot of theatrics, there's a lot of drama which you don't mind, mm. which is fair enough. But I think that it's, it's kind of the discourse has been brought down or stooped to its very basic level. And therefore, there's no great intellectual intellectualism mm. if you want it in the debates mm. in the so you know i'm not saying it should be highly intellectual and therefore nobody understands it mm. but reason has been a big casualty mm. theatrics has been the big gain mm. and therefore the level of discourse is you know tutu meme of the very how to how very trite kind mm. and finally when you watch tv this is what we used to say in the old days okay you know all those who want to clap and sit, sit in the front rows and those who don't want to clap in the, in the back rows because they, won't, they don't want to be seen clapping. Right now, it seems that the whole approach is make everybody clap but at the lowest basic level. Right. Okay. So, let me come to the third aspect of this. Uh, Ranjana, let me put this one to you uh, since you, you write on media a lot. Now, is, if this were not reported by media, uh, of course, we are now used to seeing a lot of things in raw form, particularly election speeches and so on. So, therefore, I guess we all have access to it. But in general, if media were not going to highlight or, or were not to highlight some of these things, would things have been different? Yeah, I, I think to some extent I agree with you. I think every election this kind of talk does happen. 
and it's seen as street level banter or give and take. But this election magnified tremendously. But I find it very amusing that we started with uh, corruption, then we went on to development, regardless of which party. And now we've come down to those little fissures of Indian society with one party desperately trying to save its family and their reputation, the other party going along its usual religion lines, the caste parties on their lines, and it's just become a free for all. You know, it's like watching WWE, quite frankly. Okay. So, uh, Dilip, if it's become like WWE, what, are these wrestlers who are essentially coming into the field and we are now seeing their true form? Or are these people who are otherwise nice chaps uh, or not chaps or whatever, um, men and women who are being forced by circumstances to say things that they would have never done otherwise? You know, there is a secular trend of, um, of people like them entering politics, people like them as opposed to people like us. And I think that there is one aspect which is due to the language and the and the and the common parlance that they use, which is probably a different language from what you and I are used to or expect to. The second thing is that even among the leaders who are better uh, educated, better, uh, um, more conscious of what they are saying, there is they feel there is this need to descend to a, a few notches below what they used to before. And we are also forgetting that um, many of them are living life bite-sized. They are making sure that they make these camera-friendly bite uh, uh, clips which uh, can then spread virally. And that brings me to the subject of the language of discourse on social media is already at such a new low, and I'm sure you want to explore that later, is already at such a new low that politicians are finding it easy to come to that level because that is the language that seems to be exchanged across uh, the millions of trolls who are on most websites and on, uh, and on political subjects. So, Dilip, you're saying that social media is influencing the real world which is leading to these kind of outbursts or statements in public domain? I'm saying you're working in tandem. I'm not saying one is influencing the other. Right. I'm saying there are two aspects. One, there is a whole bunch of new people who are in politics who are not used to the kind of language and who don't believe the kind of discourse that you and I hope hmm. would be the language of parliament. Hmm. After all, parliament is expected to elevate things to a policy level, to a level of debate where the entire nation can be engaged and not microcosms, as Ranjana said, little caste issues, little, little local issues or little, um, you know, the gutter they're all in. So, unfortunately, right. every politician seems to be happy to belong in that little gutter. Yeah, I, I, I also feel, uh, Govind and, of course, uh, Dilip and Rajana, that the decibel levels have gone up, go, gone up, you know, manifold. Mm. And the stakes are very high. And therefore, the intensity of battle is, you know, I mean, it's, and, and, it's and the there. amplification is high the as well. The amplification is high, and therefore, it's leading people to do all kinds of things, which perhaps hmm. uh, maybe post elections they're going to reflect on and say, "Hey, I, maybe." I Just to give an example, hmm. Bangalore playing Mumbai in the IPL <laughs> match, and you saw what happened between Mitchell Stark hmm. and Kieran Pollard. Hmm. You know, they hmm. got abusive. One guy threw the bat; he could have thrown the bat at anybody. Somebody could have got hit. And hmm. post match, hmm. you know. They I happened to be there. They were having, not just have. First, they were very cagey with each other, hmm. and then they were both very shamefaced as hmm. to that this has happened. Hmm. They both are international cricketers. Hmm. They are not domestic cricketers, first timers. They are seasoned players in the IPL, hmm. and this, suddenly the spotlight is on them, and they're looking like you know, hey, did we make a fool of ourselves? So, are our political candidates even shameful or shamefaced, as uh, Ayaz quoted in his analogy of the two cricketers, uh, Dilip? Um. I think so. I would, I would tend to feel that um, today's, um, what I have said, today's discourse is really um, lacking in substance and it has come about very suddenly. You have ascribed it uh, at, at the beginning of your comments to the heat of May, but I think it, it, the trigger point was something else. Debate punched to a new low when the sudden meme kutu between uh, Priyanka Gandhi and Narendra Modi started and then everybody started using words which had not previously been in the lexicon of elections 2014 itself. 
Right. So, uh, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, the first, of course, says that uh, Modi as a PM candidate should have led by example by not falling to such levels, but he seems to enjoy and play around with it. The second one is, does this discourse not reflect on the kind of society we are? This is who we are and we are just getting that back. So, Ayaz, the, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Now, let me come back to that, right? So, there is a political stage yeah. and I'm talking about the physical stage on which a politician goes and for lack of any other word, performs. Right? Has that performance now completely divorced from the larger function of uh, being in politics, governance, going to parliament and so on? I think really, are we talking about two different things and therefore are we perhaps expecting too much? I think that's true. I think mm. we're talking about two different things because this is performance to get votes. Mm. We have to wait and see what performance is going to be in parliament in terms of policy making, in yeah. terms of governance. Sometimes performance in parliament itself is shameful mm. and we've seen enough evidence of that. Yeah. But this is really to get votes mm. and it's very populist, it's very at times very below the belt, yeah. at times it can shock us because mm. our sensibilities may be different mm. and that's where I think the question is right that maybe sitting here our sensibilities are a little different from maybe what the ma vast majority sensibilities are now because I think the political class is also getting feedback and saying hey mm. what is working for us? Mm. Can I hit a little lower below mm. the belt? Can I be a little shriller? Can I yeah. be a little more profane? Yeah. All that is coming through very and, clearly. And the answer to me. seems to be yes. And the answer seems to be yes. And the same question, Ranjana, for media. Where is the? How is the uh, the the denominator, if one may say so, moving here? Well, I think apart from the, you know, there is a certain distastefulness to the low level of discourse, but it's also that they're playing to the gallery, and the media is very much part of that. In a sense, we shouldn't be too surprised because if you look at the sort of uh, prime time discussions we have on TV and the way uh, guests talk to each other, it's sort of, you know, there are indicators there. And uh, as I think Ayaz pointed out, uh, the area in our various legislative assemblies has been shameful for a while now. So it's like playing to the gallery to the extreme. And I don't even know if it's playing to the lowest common denominator or only to the hinterland because everyone seems to enjoy it. So no, I, I think as no, pointed so the out, of, yeah, no, no, so media, go no, ahead, it's, it's, it's everywhere. No, Rajana, my question is, uh, media as we know it, I mean the media that you for instance look and observe and then uh, write on periodically, uh, is that now part of the same political stage, the physical political stage that we talk about and in some ways has divorced itself from the real questions, the real issues of governance and accountability and all of that stuff? I think uh, very sadly my answer would be largely yes. I think the media has and unfortunately the way the visual media operates, it seems to, you know, it moves in that direction. Then everyone else sort of runs behind quickly to catch up. So print has to report what TV has done. It just becomes a nice little uh, uh, sort of uh, dog chasing its tail. But yes, I think the media has a huge role to play in this. It can't uh, divest itself of any responsibility. Right. So, Dilip, uh, how's, how, how do you see the, the role of media? I mean, this is obviously an oft-asked question, but in, in this particular, at this particular point, as we've said that the denominator seems to be descending on a daily basis, is, is media sort of accompanying that descent with equal, if not greater pace? I think, um, and I'm, I'm happy to debate this, but I think social media has also contributed as much as visual media has mm -hmm. the lowering of this denominator okay. the need to create the need to create certain kind of crass hashtags for example is something that the visual media is playing to and they're playing to it because it helps them to amplify on social media so um, the kind of uh, you know would not have those kind of hashtags on a headline for a story for instance so um, they are they are playing to this, and the denominator is is uh, falling quite rapidly. Okay, so there are two parts of what you are saying, Dilip. One is the role of social media, the presence or the creation of these hashtags, which are clearly uh, uh, of a of a more uh, pop populist nature. Media. Yeah. Uh, what, what, do you see these two things influencing each other? Yes. Yeah, I I actually feel that uh, a, a lot of what we are talking about, mm. and especially the 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 cons of what we are talking about it has to do more with broadcast media mm -hmm. and social media because there is you know the geographical spread mm. is quicker and much wider than say newspapers mm. perhaps even radio mm. and the need for all the platforms mm. to reach out as far and wide and so as soon as possible mm. and therefore you 
even they are not sure as to what is populist or not. They are still exploring. Mm -hmm. They are also in a very competitive so you're environment. Saying that, you're saying that social media, or rather, we are saying in some ways that social media is the is the laboratory for all the stuff that could potentially happen in the real world, and it's also effectively become the test pilot or the test it base. It could, but also broadcast media yeah. in terms of television, say, as is is. is you know, because of the competition within itself, as well as they don't know how much the audience is willing to lap up in the, mm. in the charge for getting TRPs, everything becomes kosher. Right. No, that's fine. And that's because it's a failed business model. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's. So, uh, Dilip, let me come back to you. You know, the role of social media in being the trigger for all of this. To what extent do you think this is happening, uh, I mean, on a, literally on a daily basis? And as, is that really responsible for the level of depths that we've plumbed to now? I think the the elephant in the room which we are not discussing mm -hmm. is the language of generation now okay um, that language has also got shall we say a lot more of leeway on what is um, legitimate to talk about or language that can be used so what used to be considered a level of abuse which was not appropriate for adult behavior is now considered pretty normal Okay. Any examples that come to mind, Dilip? I'm I'm not very good at examples, <laughs> but they are okay. all around you. Okay, we okay. shut our ears. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I'll give you one now that you now that you tell me. Uh, it's it's um, you know, Ulu Banawing is um, you know is now yeah. <laughs> from advertising to social media. It, it's quite normal. But about five years ago, if you if you said that somebody was making an Ulu out of you, it was considered a higher level of abuse than it is today. Okay. But it's a marketing statement. <laughs> right. But uh, I mean, I, I agree, uh, uh, Dilip, on the consumption side that you know there is a Gen Now and a Gen X and so on. But the people who are uh, you know who are using these words, the donkeys and the monkeys and so on, they're pretty old. Yeah. I mean, they really belong to uh, Gen. I don't know what. I mean, you know, it's A or something. <laughs> yeah, even if they belong to Gen A, huh. they they are um, first in their unguarded moments. They are worse than Gen Now. Okay. And so they find <laughs> that Gen Now discourse, having got as low as it is, they are a whole bunch more comfortable. <laughs> but is that okay? So Dilip, uh, I mean, we're asking this question. I know again and again. But is that the real? Is that the true self uh, of these of these people we are wanting to or likely to elect as our candidates and representatives to Parliament? Sadly, yes, I see them every day. Okay, Ayaz. <laughs> so one of the, I mean, we've been kind of uh, bashing up the media and ourselves a bit, but I must say also there is a flip side. Perhaps it's not as pronounced mm -hmm. because in the discourse we haven't appreciated or seen enough of it. Mm -hmm. One is that the massive proliferation of the media has also made our worldview bigger, mm -hmm. given us insights into things that we would otherwise normally not have got. For okay. just to give a very basic example, mm -hmm. what's happening in Amethi? Mm -hmm. None of us knew hmm. till very recently hmm. the media decided hmm. that we must go and investigate, interrogate, find out hmm. whether we've got the entire picture or not is not hmm. the point. Hmm. But you know, also I feel that as, at a consumption level, hmm. the really low level of discourse which we may have, we may have seen, the pointless you know protests and you know the haranguing that we may have seen from political leaders, hmm. at some stage there will be a threshold where people will say, hey, hmm. you know, no loo banawing. Hmm which is what Dilip is saying, you yeah. might tell yourselves that and mm. therefore they'll have to change the game also. Okay. I mean, I'm hoping. Right. So, which in, in some ways brings me to the larger question, uh, uh, Dilip, uh, Ayaz and Ranjana. You know, uh, one thing is the political and theatre and, the, and the, uh, the antics on the political stage, which might be brought about by the experiences of the moment. Uh, the larger question is, what is going to happen when all these people get elected? Uh, the, the, uh, the optimistic side in me believes that uh, the, all this will be forgotten. Narendra Modi has already talked about, you know, a situation wherein if he becomes prime minister, he has to carry everyone along, and therefore, uh, you know, whether it's uh, 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 criminal cases against some people, whether it's uh, utterances made in the heat of uh, uh, the political uh, moment, all of that will be forgotten and things will be normal. But the flip side is that it could be there could be, you know, you know, I, I mean, something pretty dangerous waiting around the corner. That is that you will have a whole bunch of people who don't know what they're doing. You know, uh, your kind of... Yeah, go ahead, Dilip. Your fond belief that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas is not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> it's a question. You know, it's a question, yeah. Uh, once this course 
has descended to this level, um, it's very difficult for it to ratchet much higher. And yes, I do hope that leaders recognize that to actually pass legislative business requires a far greater level of consensus unless you have a bludgeoning majority in your hands. And um, you know, if you have a bludgeoning majority, then the cracks happen within your majority and not without. That's the only difference. So there is no doubt that what is going to happen is that the exigencies of parliament will bring about a slightly better level of discourse, but it will be extremely thin ice that we are all skating on. Right. So in some ways, I mean, from the sublime to the ridiculous, we've already answered the question by saying it is the ridiculous. Let me, uh, uh, Ranjana, you wanted to say something before I come back with another, yeah. with another point. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, uh, the American election system, especially the primaries where within the parties they're choosing their own candidates and that's a system which the BJP uh, says that they love so much and they appear to, they're extremely vicious with each other when they're fighting to become the, uh, the uh, presidential candidate. And then right after the election, if they win, they've got to work together. Now, maybe this election is a test for us whether we reach that level of maturity or not. You know, having called everybody donkeys, monkeys, uh, low, niche, whatever else, you know, have, are we going to be able to rise above that? I really, I'm not even sure of that. Because our behavior in parliament for the past three years has been quite, uh, you know, distressing. Right. So, uh, Dilip, the point that you made, and I think uh, there is, uh, I can see some agreement on this, that once you've uh, plumbed a new level uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, a new denominator, so to speak, you pretty much remain there for a long time and, and drawing back is very difficult. The question that is, that in some ways worries me is, what kind of example are we setting for the next generation? Because we talked about Gen Now, we talked about Gen Now being, you know, comfortable with his language. Is Gen Now absorbing this as, uh, uh, as theatre or is it something that, is it sort of receiving it as uh, either wisdom or uh, a way to do things and thus therefore does this have an even more damage creation capability? I think that we've pretty much reached a stage where Gen now is beginning to get browned off. And I think that uh, the change will only happen when there is a pushback from Gen now. And that's going to happen very soon is what I'm hoping for fondly. Okay. I ask. So, uh, just to present an agnostic point of view here, agnostic to what we've been talking about so far. Maybe there was always this level of discourse which we didn't know much about because yeah. the media yeah. was not so you know, all not so all pervasive yeah. uh, and therefore, you know, ultimately the politicians are talking to their voters, to mm -hmm. other voters, to the world, wide, wide world at large. So obviously, perhaps the media needs to be a little selective, not easy mm -hmm. because you are going out and trying to reach the maximum. The, the good part which has happened is that I think that it's become a little more, maybe in small compartments, it's become a little more incisive, a little more penetrative. Mm. So, what's happening in VVVIP seats like mm. Amethi mm. or really questions being asked, what the hell is this Gujarat model all about? Mm. Questions have been asked, whether mm. they've been answered or not is a different issue. Right. So, maybe, you know, uh, advance the remedy and suppress the mischief okay. is what the media should be doing. Right. So, uh, the question of media, uh, again, to come back to it, uh, Ranjana, assuming, let's say, the media were to uh, self discipline itself when it comes to covering these issues or rather, you know, highlighting these uh, uh, behaviors and so on. Will that be a way forward in terms of if we were to, let's say, after June 1st, uh, come to a new calmer world? Well, yes, if the media, even in this election, done its job by uh, not being reactive to everything every sort of politician said and actually looked at the issues which this election is supposed to be about, we may not have had quite such a circus and definitely once we get back, that's what we'll have to do. We'll have to look at those issues. You know, nightly television drama, I think has somehow, it's entered into our subconscious. We don't even think of it as a strange thing anymore. That from uh, 8 to 10, the whole country has to sit down and watch people yelling at each other. And the election just uh, sort of uh, is the same thing on a larger scale. And, and as, as Dilip would say, this, uh, and there's the social media aspect where there are hashtags and there are, uh, you know, incendiary hashtags and people uh, uh, spitting venom at each other and all of that's also part of adding to the, uh, to the mix. Is that right, Dilip? Yes. And what I worry even more is that um, once the 
shouting and the screaming from 8 to 10 as Ranjana colorfully put it ends we might be creating for the market for a new kind of soap with that which has even lower levels of language which the public will have to watch just because we need a period of of replacing like with like uh, Dilip, you don't uh, you don't feel that the media could uh, control, constrain, and therefore uh, you know change the uh, you know the the nature of the discourse, so to speak, uh, somewhat maybe after the June first. Do you? I think that that horse has already bolted out of the stable. <laughs> With the explosion of media, yeah. there is always somebody willing to plumb a lower depth and get a higher TRP. Right. No, so that's a business model problem. I'm assuming if, let's say, the business model problem were to get fixed somehow. Of course, that will also take a miracle of sorts. But assuming somehow there is consolidation, there are fewer players. Not everyone has to run for the same advertising pie. Assuming somehow things get sorted out, or on the other hand, the gen now that you uh, talked of pushes back and says that you know you can do what you want, but we really want, are not paying attention because everyone is doing the same thing. If, if both these things happen together mm. and if the blowback from Gen Now is as strong as the consolidation in media next, mm. then we would be able to see a higher level of discourse, yes. Okay. And till then, what's going to happen, Ayaz? <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen, but to take a pot shot at ourselves, Govind, yeah. I, if, if the matter and the issues are not so serious, this would be the most wonderful spoof that we've seen over the last six, eight years. 10 weeks. Okay. Because, you know, I mean, look at what's been happening. Yeah. Right from what Ranjana said, two hours of bashing every day on prime time to the kind of people, you know, the way they've been talking to each other, about each other, uh, sometimes to their own party people. Hmm. It's, it's been, you know, it's out of some, you know, fantasy flick. world. <laughs> it's out of some <laughs> 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 flick, which would be a wonderful spoof, except that, you know, for us as citizens, not just as media persons, there it also has ramifications. So, uh, Ranjana, let me come, come to you and then Dilip. I mean, if, if the shift has to happen, and if, let's say, assuming we all believe that there has to be a shift, one is to uh, go back to the two points that Dilip and I just discussed. But if there has to be a shift, is media the only person who can drive this shift in uh, the way uh, things are either, uh, you know, disseminated and therefore then consumed? Well, I, I would say, and I'm not uh, being nice to you here, something like this that you're doing with these hangouts, uh, it at least offers an alternative. Whatever numbers you're getting, at least there's an alternative you can watch someone else. I think as Ayal pointed out, a comedy, I think, is a huge way of doing it. I mean, you've ever seen John Oliver's eight-minute clip on the uh, US coverage of the Indian elections and his a little bit on the falsification of Indian news? It was absolute genius. Oh, and I think there are efforts in India to move away from this. I mean, even without social media, and there is no doubt that the bottom level of social media is absolute filth. But there is a lot of other stuff happening as well, and a lot right. of sharing of that relevant information. So I think that the mainstream media, as it's called, needs to watch out a bit here because there are options coming up. Right. And you know, it's not going to remain static this way forever. Right. Okay. Uh, Dilip, last word. I, I, I like the optimism in what Ranjana is positing and I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm actually happy to see that it's actually it's real. So uh, if enough numbers join that, then there will be an alternate discourse which I hope will become the mainstream discourse. Okay, thank you very much. Ayaz? So, so uh, final word if I have it, I mean look. Uh, sorry, Dilip, were you sorry, saying, Dilip, something saying something? No, thank you. Okay, no. yeah. So obviously, you know, you can't say everything should be the way the world according to <laughs> Govind and Ayaz and us. Uh, also, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, there should be censorship. Yeah. It doesn't mean that. When, if you want the level of discourse to rise. Mm -hmm. or I mean, we haven't used the word censorship once. We have not used it. Yeah. It's, it's not even. Yeah, and know, that's not, not what we're talking about. It's here. not yeah. what we're talking about. If you want the level to, of discourse to rise, mm -hmm. then it has to come from the people. I don't think it's only the political class mm -hmm. or only the media. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately what I would say, for want of a better word, mm -hmm the consumers want from their political leaders mm. or from their media mm. and if there is a rejection of a certain kind mm. then you know the, the obvious changes and shifts will take place. Right. And, and arguably as it perhaps has happened in the way voters are rejecting caste based Absolutely. politics and going Absolutely. for more economics based politics and so on. So, on. so perhaps this election will also be a uh, barometer of sorts of what uh, people really want. That's all we have time for. Thank you folks for joining us Dilip, uh, Ranjana and Ayaz. We are going to be back on the India Hangout. <laughs>